23 years, he carried the hopes and suffered the condemnation of a city held by a curse so old that grandfathers can't claim they saw the Red Sox win the World Series. But if he was unable to deliver his fans to total victory, he took them high and far into the realm of the possible. Through a career with as many ups and downs as an internet stock, Carl Yastrzemski was Boston's ultimate survivor. No one succeeds Ted Williams, you just replace him. But the Red Sox deliberately, consciously said, this is our successor. He had been an infielder in the Carolina League, and they said, oh, you're going to play outfield, you're going to play left field. And they gave him number eight, next to number nine. The ghost was still in left field. All of a sudden, people were comparing him to Williams, and he hated that. The comparison seemed valid when Yastrzemski hit 377 as a minor league rookie in 1959, winning the batting title and the notice of Sports Illustrated. When he reported to the Red Sox for spring training in 61, his personal batting instructor was the man himself, number nine. I was in the big leagues at 20 years old. Uh, when Ted started talking hitting, I didn't know what he was talking about. Ted, by that time, was no longer the splendid splinter. He was a larger-than-life guy, both physically and, and mentally, really. He reminded me of myself. He's wound up like a clock. He's ready to go. Ted would walk in and give him help, really. He had his hands up here. Way over his head like he's going to kill a snake at home plate. And he dropped a little bit. But why go through all that motion and stuff? And you can't swing the ball, a bat, as fast and as quick here as you can when your hands are here. Yaz was young, bullheaded, didn't listen to Ted, and there was a real conflict between the two. So I kind of almost stayed away from him. That was along the lines of Yogi Berra. You see the ball, you hit it. You know, you don't have time to think. The Boston press did not help matters by running a daily comparison of Yastrzemski's rookie numbers to those of his mentor. Coming into Williams' footsteps in his shadow my first couple months almost destroyed me. Now, I tried to become Ted Williams. I didn't think the fans would be satisfied with somebody hitting the ball up in the middle and getting base hits and that. Consequently, after the first couple months, I was hitting like 220. Confused, dispirited, and perhaps a bit chastened, the struggling rookie beseeched Red Sox owner Tom Yawkey to call Williams back into service. Boy, the next day he was there. He didn't talk about hitting or anything, and he just tried to restore my confidence. He said, you yeah, natural hit and boom, boom, do what's natural to you. And he stayed around for a couple days, and uh, he lifted up my spirits mentally. Reclaiming his stroke, Yastrzemski finished the season with a respectable 266 average and 11 homers. Fourteen years later, Yastrzemski faced another crisis of confidence, but he became a full-time first baseman upon the arrival of two superbly talented rookie outfielders, Fred Lynn and Jim Rice. Yes, going to first base was a symbolic, as well as an actual demotion. People say, well, that's where old ball players go to die. I think he was insulted because he believed that he could still play left field better than anybody. So all of a sudden, Yastrzemski realized he's fighting for his own survival. He's just an average ball player with a bunch of phenoms that are coming up. And that drove Yastrzemski and put him over the hump and made him go. On the eve of the 1975 playoffs against Oakland, Yaz was moved back to left field, replacing an injured Jim Rice. I remember going up to him and saying, you know, you haven't played very much left field this year. Now, how's it going to be getting back in there? And he didn't even blink an eyelash. He said, I can play left field in my sleep. And he gets out there, and he is bouncing around like a 22-year-old kid. He's going in the corner, getting balls uh, off the wall, throwing guys out at second base. We said, wow, what is this? Hey, Yaz, what are you taking here? And he played left field like a master. The A's were amazed at the plays he made out there. He was so proud of his defensive efforts in that series. He's talked about it several times. The Jackson lines in the left field base hit. 
Dostrowski goes over, back end, and Jackson's going to go for two. Here's the throw coming on. He is out. Captain Carl Dostrowski leading the troops again. And I remember asking Reggie Jackson about the play. And he said there are only two people that could have made that play on me, Carl Dostrowski and God. I've never seen a guy beat a club with his glove, especially an outfielder like he did. Hitting 455, Yaz led the Red Sox to a sweep of the three-time defending world champions. Although Boston would lose the World Series to the Reds in seven games, New England was comforted that winter by the knowledge that Yastrzemski was still young at 36. He just rededicated himself, and it showed two years later in 1977, his 17th Major League season, he wins a gold glove. I would describe him as, as the last of the Depression-era ball players. I believe he had one stint on the disabled list in his entire career. He crowded the plate and he was hit a lot, but his whole attitude was, you can't hurt me. You're throwing chocolate eclairs at me, pal. You got nothing. Every swing was total commitment. I can hear a tremendous sound of the bat hitting his back when you take a full swing, and then the grunt that followed it. The guy hits a deep drive to left center field, Jastrzemski's playing left field. He goes back to the scoreboard, leaps up, makes his great catch, and comes down and slams right into the scoreboard. The trainer goes up, he has his up, and he says he's okay, and the fans give him a big ovation. He is tougher than a nickel steak, that man. After the game's over, Yaz goes to the hospital, gets x-rays, Turns out he's got a broken rib. A, a tremendous competitor. I mean, he would fight with the umpires, and he would tell them, that's not a strike, and don't call that strike on me anymore. And I was like, wow, this guy is talking to the umpire like that. But he had that kind of respect. I called a pitch on him, and uh, he said, the pitch is outside. And I said, it was a good pitch, Yaz. And he said, my name's not Yaz. And I got the point real quick. And when you think of Yaz, you think of Yaz as the quintessential New Englander. Terse, tense, gritty, was, uh, was a stand-up guy. And I mean, he was there for you, but in, in his very coiled way. He's a very hard, tough man, tough man to get to know. Yeah, he didn't care about how people perceived him. He didn't care about how other players perceived him. He didn't even care really about how most of his teammates perceived him. And he was moody. I don't know if it's something in the left field wall or the left field that causes Rice to be moody, Ted Williams to be moody, Carl Yastrzemski to be moody. You know, it's got to be lead or something out there. Filings from all the line drives, and they inhaled way too much out there when they were playing left. There are no stars on Potato Farm. Everybody's the same. I lived a simple life here. A really good life. Raised in a small town on the eastern end of Long Island, Karl Yastrzemski was the older of two sons, born to a first-generation Polish potato farmer. Well, Bridgeham was a town probably of 1,800 people. It wasn't discovered by New York City yet, so it was a small farming community. Baseball was in the family blood. Carl Sr. and his four brothers formed the core of a local baseball team. The team was called the uh, White Eagles, and uh, because the White Eagles represented Poland. They were built like they were cut out of granite. They, they were just incredible uh, physical specimens. Ever since I was like seven years old, all the uncles used to drop over in the morning before they go to work, and I used to have a sawed-off bat, and they used to get a tennis ball and put me up against the garage and try to strike me out. So I had constant competition. On the farm or the baseball field, Yastrzemski was always under parental observation. His father played second base for the White Eagles. Carl Sr. was as good a ball player as well, not better than Junior. Terrific hit, hit bullets. And never struck out. Never. Carl Sr. had amazing power. The Dodgers and Cardinals offered Carl Sr. minor league contracts, but he stayed home. Can you imagine a kid, an American kid, great ball player, gives up a baseball career because he was afraid that if he didn't make it, he would lose his farm. 
The first field that Carl ever played on was just a little clearing in the farm where the potatoes had been growing, and his father cut that field down and made it into a baseball field. Mistrancy's dad was like Mickey Mantle's dad, who always would take the kid out and work him hard every day so that one day he would be a major league ball player. And his father didn't want him to catch him because he didn't want him to get hurt. Because he knew he had a kid there that someday was going to go somewhere. And Carl was a good listener and did exactly what his father would tell him to do. He saw his father in godlike terms, it seems. He, his father was the guy that had all the answers. The discipline, discipline, discipline. Don't get distracted. In a life consumed by farming and baseball, the family mantra was work now, play later. But we would be playing hardball right in front of his house, and Carl would be on the front steps uh, with his brother Richie uh, shucking peas. If you looked at the whole Ustremski clan and the whole family, they were hardworking, church-going people. And Carl was an altar boy, and they never missed mass. And I think when you grow up in that environment, you can't help but being a hardworking young man. He had a clean tongue. He never raised hell or anything like that. At Bridgehampton High School, Yastrzemski excelled in sports, starring on the baseball team and setting a Suffolk County scoring record in basketball. But when he went out for football, Carl Sr. pulled rank. I used to stay after school and give him some excuse. I had to do homework or something, and I started working out with the football team. Well, he found out about it, and uh, one of the practices, he was there. He came walking right over, yanked me right off the field, and he said, you're not getting hurt playing football. Any jam shoulder or anything like that could ruin a baseball career. Hitting 650 as a senior, Yastrzemski was under constant major league surveillance. But we could tell that, that Carl Yastrzemski could hit a fastball right then, 18 years old. He could hit a major league fastball. Part of his accelerated hitting education occurred during the summers when Carl and his father played on local teams. They were the best father-son act on Long Island. Junior about a third and Carl Sr. about a fourth. Mr. Stramski, age 41, 42, could out hit Carl all day long. Well, they were actually competitive amongst themselves. Carl got up and mentioned about if he was going to hit a home run. Well, he had this pitcher figured out, and so he hit one. And all my uncles start razzing my dad and everything, who came up next. And uh, my dad just said, just watch this. And he probably hit a home run about another 50 feet further than what Carl just hit. Oh, yeah, they say, oh, the old man's still out hitting you and out playing you. And you never be good as the old man anyway. Yeah, it's potato fields. That's where I used to hit them. Potato fields? Yeah, but how about me when I used to hit them up on top of the school? That's where I used to hit them up there. Yeah, the wind always used to blow out the left field. <laughs> the, wind, the wind never blew when I hit them. Scouts would come out to watch these people. And he heard about these Yastrzemskis hitting 400. And I think that the scouts weren't sure if they were watching the father or the son. They'd say, why are you here? We ought to sign your dad. <laughs> but the Yankees weren't laughing when Carl Jr. worked out with the team in the spring of 1957. A scout named Ray Garland had looked at him in the stadium. And then they went to Yaz's house. So finally it came down to where my dad wrote a figure down and a Yankee scout wrote a figure down. They exchanged papers. And Carl got accepted to Notre Dame. And my dad wanted the Yankees to guarantee that in the off season he would go to South Bend to get his education. And he wanted the Yankees to pay for it. The scout from the Yankees threw the pencil up in the air and hit the ceiling of the house. And he says, nobody ever received a bonus like this from the New York Yankees. And Yez's father said, get the hell out of my house. No one throws a pencil in my house. Go. Go back to New Jersey. And maybe that's why Carl Yastrzemski never became a Yankee. That summer, Yastrzemski accepted a scholarship to Notre Dame for basketball and baseball. But midway through his sophomore year, the 19-year-old was the prize in a major league bidding war. It had come down to the Phillies, Reds, Tigers and Boston Red Sox. We were driving from Notre Dame. We stopped at Cincinnati, worked out there for an hour, then I went to Detroit. We wanted to sign him. The ownership at that time could not believe that you would give a young ball player 100,000. 
$1,000. And then when we got to Boston, it was snowing, and I couldn't see right field so far away. And my dad said to me, he says, you'll love playing here. And I kind of looked at him, I said, are you looking at the same ballpark I am? That's right, with 310 feet. And I said, this is 380 feet unless you can wrap it around a foul pole. He said, no, you enjoy playing here, and that was it. Yes, had told me about how he had gone to sleep at night, almost crying himself to sleep. He didn't want to play in Boston, but his father wanted him to play in Boston, and he didn't want to. And he called me up and he said, you know, Jerry says, I don't know about saying something about not agreeing with my father. And to me, it was very telling that, yes, Stremski was 45 years old at the time. We were writing a book, Hall of Famer, and was concerned about looking as if he was being disrespectful to his father. Is there anything in here for a headache? My parents should have something. Uh, my first six years playing with the Red Sox, it was tough playing baseball. Because the teams were so bad, uh, ultimately, the fans that came out, they came out to see Kyle Stremski get two or three hits. And if Kyle Stremski didn't get two or three hits, they let you know about it. He thought the team was going nowhere. He'd get very temperamental about it. There was a lot of tension. But he would hit a pop-up sometimes, and he'd, he, he'd just throw his bat down and just trot down in the first place. When Yaz failed to run something out, but Jake did, as we say, uh, he would hear it. And we went up to my room and sat down and talked. And he says, Kurt, why are they booing me so much? I said, you really want to know, Carl? I said, you're not hustling. Hell, there's times when Yastrzemski didn't run out balls back when he was younger and stuff. And there were ball players that had him up there, and boom, they were just going to beat the living crap out of him, a couple of pitchers in particular. He came to the Red Sox as a young guy. And he did some things that would irritate you sometimes. He'd run the bases with his head down. Johnny Pesky was the manager that a great character. Yastrzemski had made a dumb base running play that had cost him the game. And in the lock, <laughs> Pesky's gone. I said, that dumb Polak, is he ever going to learn to run the bases? In 1964, Pesky benched Yastrzemski for not hustling. When the manager was let go later that season, a few Boston writers blamed the firing on a close relationship between the Red Sox left fielder and the team's owner. Tom Yawkey didn't have children. He had an adopted daughter. He didn't have any sons. So when Ted Williams came up, Tom, in a way, adopted Ted. And then when Ted retired and, and Carl came up, Tom Yawkey adopted Carl. The problem with this was that it gave Carl a tremendous amount of power in the organization. That's very unfair. I never talked about a manager, Tom Yorkie. He wanted to know everything. Where? Well, how are you pitching him and stuff like that? He wanted to know, boom, 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 baseball. In 1966, Yastrzemski hit 278 with just 16 homers. He had nowhere to go but up. He spent the winter working with a trainer here in Boston named Gene Birdie. He must have been in some army where he was trained to kill people by training them. <laughs> and what took place was he would put Yas through a 45-minute workout. Well, I lasted 22 minutes. And I mean, I couldn't breathe. I thought I was dead. And when he came to camp in 1967, Yas had the aggression. But Williams said, you ought to be able to pull and hit 30, 40 home runs every year with that stroke you had. And he changed his stance to where he came up, up in here. I was going to be Ted Williams again. Uh, and I said, no matter what, uh, I'm going to stay with this. I don't care if I hit 250. I'm going to become a dead pull hit. Well, he was so strong. Even in spring training, uh, his bat was so much quicker. Pitches that I used to throw him on the inside part of the plate that maybe he'd squirt out the left field, all of a sudden he's pulling him down the line. The amazing thing was the disbelief that they kept pitching to him, almost as they didn't believe that he was doing what he was doing. His presence and the type of year that he was having lifted everyone to play at a higher level. I know it did me. You couldn't have a better base runner, you couldn't have a better thrower, you couldn't have a better fielder, hitter. Uh, you had the perfect ball player at that particular time. At the All-Star break, Yastrzemski was back in top form, hitting 324 with 19 homers, and the Red Sox were six games behind the first-place White Sox. By September, Boston was still in the hunt with three other teams, and all of New England hung on every at-bat. Time was out of control. I mean, I was working on news at the time, and 
we had as many news reporters out covering Fenway Park and as sports department. It was so exciting to the people involved, you numb. You could walk down the streets of Dorchester, or South Boston. If you didn't have a radio, that's fine. Everybody had one, and you could hear in the sounds wafting through the night. Fly ball to deep left. Your Kresge is going hard. Way back, way back. And he dives and makes a prestigious catch. Yes, Belton deep to right field. Drifting into the sand for a home run. We'd come home after the games in 67. All the trees in our yard would be tissue papered with signs all over the house and shaving cream all over it. I can remember doing interviews in 67, the last month of the season, and national media coming up to me after the game uh, saying, how can you take this pressure? I said, pressure? I said, for the first time, I've enjoyed the game again. As the 1967 race entered the last weekend of the season, the Red Sox and Twins would settle their fate in a two-game series at Fenway. Yastrzemski's bat was hotter than ever. Over the last 10 games, he was hitting 444. I couldn't even sleep. I can remember saying, how am I going to be able to play today not having any sleep? He couldn't wait to get going. Couldn't wait to get his uniform on. And the guys come in, hey, yes, how you doing? All right, guys, you know, uh, we're going to win this thing. And uh, he takes off, puts his uniform on, and he's pumped up. Deep to right field. Number 44. So we win that game. Detroit and the Angels split. So whoever wins our game on Sunday between Minnesota and Boston, they'll be the champions unless Detroit wins a doubleheader and then there'll be a playoff. Uh, I didn't sleep again that night, so I went two days without sleep. I came into the deck, stayed the same thing. Base hits the center. Rodborn scores. Adair will score. It's tied up. With Yastrzemski providing much of the offense, the Red Sox beat the Twins again, assuring themselves of a tie for first place. Seven for eight in the final two biggest games of your life? You're too much. <laughs> I was trying the uh, best I could, Don, and uh, I had something going for me. I wanted to win it for Mr. Yaki. Uh, he just said it. Champagne bottles pop like gunfire when the Red Sox heard on the radio that the Tigers lost. He did something that nobody ever thought that he could do. He led the Boston Red Sox, which had not won a pennant since 1946, to the American League pennant. And he did it almost by himself. Over the last 12 games of the season, Yastrzemski went 23 for 44 with five home runs and 18 RBIs. Continuing his tear into the World Series against St. Louis, Yastrzemski hit 400 with three homers. But Bob Gibson proved to be too much in Game 7, and Boston's season ended one victory shy of heaven. Yastrzemski, meanwhile, had won the Triple Crown and the hearts of every underdog in America. The batting star of the Boston Red Sox was Carl Yastrzemski. So let's have a wonderful If Yastrzemski's revival raised his stock in the baseball world, it also raised the bar dangerously high in a city that is rarely satisfied with its heroes. In sports and entertainment, very often people uh, have a certain syndrome I call the Don McLean effect. You have the great year, you have your American pie, and then you spend the rest of your career attempting to live up to it and can't do it. Won a bad champion in 68, and uh, that was enough. They wanted the Triple Crown again. Then Carl came up with a bad wrist. I think his average went down to 265, 267, somewhere along in there. He just couldn't swing the bat. He would never tell anybody when he was hurt, and that was, that was part of the problem. So he started to get booed, booed. Everyone in the place booed him. Oh, he became a, a, a hated character in a lot of ways in Boston. You think back, Ted Williams, the same thing happened to Ted. The Ostromsky quelled the booing with 40 homers and 111 RBIs in 1969. That August, however, Gaz found himself embroiled in another confrontation with a manager. His nemesis this time was Dick Williams. We were in Oakland, and uh, Yaz had a pulled hamstring, and he had a bandaged up wrist and everything else, but he was still in the lineup. And he got thrown out at the plate, and he came in, and Williams just jumped all over him. 
he just exploded. And he called you as you were, you were dogging it. Why weren't you running hard? I thought he was kidding, you know. He said, you should have made that closer. You should have slid or something like that. And, I, and then I knew he wasn't kidding. William says, you're out of the game. It's going to cost you 500 bucks. I had an argument in the office after that game. I fired a beer can off the wall or something like that. And I said, you knew uh, that I couldn't run. Dick Williams wanted to see him traded, uh, get rid of him, and that, the whole thing. It was over as far as the two of them, they, they weren't going to be in the same clubhouse. It's not a coincidence that, you know, two, three weeks later, he was fired. In 1971, the drums of doom began beating at Fenway when Yastrzemski, bothered by a hand injury, dropped into a prolonged slump, hitting just 254 with 15 homers. He went a month without hitting a home run. He became the focus of all the Red Sox frustration. Then it got to a point where when you went to the ballpark, hey, you buy a hot dog, have a beer, and boo your Stremski. I took two balls of cotton from out of the clubhouse and went out there, and they're yelling and screaming in between it and stuff like that, and I'm waving at them, and I take out the two balls of cotton. And they stood up and gave me a standing ovation, and I never had a problem since then. When he came back, he hit 10 home runs in September of 1972, almost brought the Red Sox to the pennant. In a supercharged 1972 finale that held all the promise of 67, the Red Sox needed to sweep the last two games against the first place Tigers to win the division. The next to the last day of the season, Lowlich pitching, Harper walks, steals second, Aparicio base hit, scores him in. Here comes Ustremski up, he gets behind him, hangs a breaking ball, Gapper, K-line comes in, can't make the play. Damned if Aparicio didn't slip around in third. I mean, he went down like a, like a sack of potatoes. Just boom. And Ustremski, with his head down, ran him right off the bag. And we get beat by one run. Heartbreak returned to Boston, more poignant than ever, in Game 7 of the 1975 World Series. Down by a run to the Reds, with two outs in the ninth, number eight stepped to the plate. Well, maybe it's fitting he has the last shot. With a high fly ball. It should be all over. Who made the last out in the last World Series? No one knows. But it's Kanye Strenfi, and it's New England. Different story. That team was so young, and he was so energized with Rice and Lynn rookies. Burleson was under 25. Fisk was young. He asked, thought, you know, I'm going to win two, three, four World Series in the next eight years. In 1978, the Red Sox were on fire and led the Yankees by 14 games on July 19th. By mid-September, their cushion had dissipated, and it took a run of eight straight victories to tie New York and force a one-game playoff. I remember going to bed that night thinking, I'm gonna be facing Yaz for the final out. And that next day, I have never felt so much electricity in a ballpark in all my life. Drive to right field, this is deep, and this ball is gone, a home run for Yastrzemski. God bless him, I'll tell you, that's unbelievable. Yastrzemski's second inning homer put the Red Sox up 1-0. By the top of the seventh, they led 2-0. But with two Yankees on and two out, Lightning struck Boston yet again. Deep to left. Yastrzemski will not get his home run. A three-run home run for Bucky Dunn. The Yankees now lead by a score of 3-2. In the eighth, Yastrzemski singled in a run as the Red Sox closed to 5-4. to four. Ball is hit up the middle for a base hit. Here comes Jerry Remy around second base. With two outs in the ninth, Fenway held its collective breath as Goose Gossage faced the man in his dream. Yaz comes to the plate, and I thought, well, this is what you went to bed last night thinking. I didn't want anybody else to be there. I loved it. I absolutely loved it when the game was on the line. Yaz had a, a 400 batting average against Gossage coming into that at bat. I have never been so nervous in a ball game in all my life. I stood out there on that mound, and I was literally shaking. 39 years of age, he has hit a home run and a single. I remember being at first base, and I said, this is perfect. I said, this is just what we want, just what Boston wants, just what he wants. All these people who are literally up, wringing their hands, praying. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to save us. 
Damn, Yaz just missed it. I mean, he didn't miss it by more than a half an inch. The Yankees win. And the place got so quiet that it was it was eerie. So on October 2nd, 1978, it is a gloomy day for the Boston Red Sox. I mean, I had grown men crying in a clubhouse. He cried, I cried, Gene Rice cried, I mean, everybody cried. And there's Yaz sitting there looking like he's 100 years old, and his eyes have tears in them. Then he broke down, you know, and it kind of hit me and said, you know, all this guy wants to do is win a World Series. He's done everything else. It really eats at him. People only remember that he popped up against Rich Gossage. Well, a lot of people popped up 98 mile an hour fastballs. To this day, they still haven't won that World Series. And a lot of people put that on Yaz's shoulders. When Yastrzemski retired, I looked up what I thought were his 22 biggest games. Yastrzemski not only hit 422 in those games, he slugged over 800. He said several times to me, I can't believe that we never won a world championship. But Yastrzemski was not finished. In the words of New England poet Robert Frost, he still had miles to go before he would sleep. Harry Yastrzemski was one of those guys where you were going to have to literally take a pair of scissors and cut the uniform off him. He was like a little boy. He loved to play. He loved it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, late in the season, I would say to him, we got a doubleheader tomorrow, got two right-handers pitching, name the one you want, and you sit out the other. And Yaz would look at me and he'd say, I got all winter to rest. He said, I want to play both of them. The most amazing calling card of Carl Yastrzemski is that to the last day he played at age 44 in 1983, he still could turn on a fastball, anybody's fastball. Uh-oh. See you later, baby. Upper deck home run, Yastrzemski. As Yaz got older, he was a phenomenon in the respect that he became a better fastball hitter as he got older. That was an incredible tribute at age 44. There was no other great player who had hit home runs, whether it was Mays or Aaron, or, you know, who didn't f suffer a major decline after 40 with bat speed. Carl Yastrzemski never did. He was so macho and so tough, he wouldn't go allow any pitcher including Nolan Ryan, to be able to say, I can bust him inside. If one at bat captured the character of Yastrzemski, he came in Toronto on September 24th, 1978. The sun would set right here. So it sets right down over the left field wall, and that means it shines right in the left hander's eyes as he's trying to see a 125-mile-an-hour fastball from Baylor Moore. And he's got the hat down like this, and he can't hardly see. Baylor Moore throws up bullet right at his head. He's down all over the ground. And Carl got dusted himself off. They threw a breaking ball, which you think, you see the ball coming at your head, but it breaks across. Carl hit a bullet down the right field line for a triple. One of the most spectacular examples of courage that you'd ever want to see in a game of baseball. It was unbelievable. <laughs> In 1979, the three-time batting champion was still making adjustments in his stance as he held two career goals in his sights. Here's the pitch he has. A long time to right field. That's gone. Number 400. No doubt about it. There it goes. Yaz hitting the 400th home run. He did it almost immediately. Uh, but the 3,000th hit was agony. It took so long at one point. When someone said to him, you know, this is like waiting for Franco to die, he actually laughed about it. On September 12th, Yastrzemski broke out of an 0 for 10 slump with number 3,000. I know one thing. The last hit was the hottest of all 3,000. I took so long because I really enjoyed all these standing ovations you gave me the last couple of days. After becoming the first American League player to have 3,000 hits and 400 home runs, Yastrzemski played four more years, during which his commitment to his craft never waned. He was a perfectionist. But I think there's being a perfectionist in terms of always doing the work to be the best you can be. And then there's being a perfectionist out of some sort of insecurity 
or this, this fear of failure. Yaz was obsessed with his size. Everything was about, I was a 5'10", 180 pounds. It was always, I wasn't big enough. I wish I was 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 220 pounds. Uh, then everything wouldn't have to be so perfect. When he became the designated hitter, he got the bat boys make up balls from rolls of tape, and he'd swat those in the clubhouse in between because he wanted everything to be perfect. He was always worried about, could he do it? I mean, can you imagine, guys less than 23 years, can I do it? Beyond his fear of failure was another fear. He just hated to fly, deathly afraid of being in the air. As soon as he got on the plane, he blocked it all out like he was able to block things out on the field. He blocked it out by playing cards. There would be four guys playing bridge every minute of every flight the whole season. The Red Sox team charter offered other perks. We would go to Kansas City, and this was when Coors was not allowed east of the Missouri River. And he would go out and we'd get like 40 cases of Coors, and we were flying those damn little, like, dash eights. And here's all the rookies in the back of the plane that had their legs up because they had cases of Coors. When the plane would take off, we would swear it would never get a clear of the runway because its ass was too heavy. It was dragging because of Yastrzemski's Coors beer that he was shipping back to the East Coast. <laughs> the flip side to Yastrzemski's obsessive nature was an almost manic sense of comedy that was seldom shown to the public. They do crazy things to you, they burn your clothes, they nail all your shoes in the ground. It could be two to one in the ninth inning, and you know, he has to smoke a cigarette down in the runway and put some bubble gum on it and stick it on Zim's foot. Give him a hot foot during the game. But Louis Apricio was scared to death of snakes. So Yaz and uh, and Gary Peters went out in the boat and got this you know huge snake and brought it into the clubhouse and left it in Apricio's locker, chased him all the way out into the street with no clothes on it century, New England bids farewell to Carl Yastrzemski as he makes his final curtain call at Fenway. It was a very sad day when he retired. Once he started crying, we all cried, and the fans were unbelievable on that last day. He was the first guy with the victory lap where he actually went around and touched all the people as he ran around the stadium. By the 1983 All-Star break, Yastrzemski was hitting 323, but as the season wore on and the pain in his back increased, his batting average fell 57 points. At 44, the fun had finally gone. One last time, Sally. He didn't sleep the night before. He loved Fenway, he loved the crowds, and I guess he really didn't want to face that last thing out there. To show our appreciation, we'd like to give you this small token of appreciation that's inscribed to you, and you've got no excuse now. Go get it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I won't... Uh, I'll miss all of you. Uh, I won't miss the game that much, but uh, I'll miss all your friendships. I think it was a bittersweet thing for him. I, I don't believe he wanted to see it end. I think he wanted to see it end when, in the World Series with the Red Sox winning. I was going to let the fans know the real Kyle Yastrzemski. Uh, not the one that they saw playing for uh, 23 years plus. I can remember us all being home talking and saying, we won't cry on the field, we won't cry on the field. When I look over, my two sisters are crying, my brother is crying, I'm crying. <laughs> I thought it was really a touching thing because a man who never wanted anyone to see him finally saw it all pour out. And we knew then that he was human enough to allow himself to cry. I hope, I hope you will think of me, think of me as, a winner, as a winner because I feel just playing one game at Fenway Park makes me a winner. And I hope I represented Boston and New England with class and with dignity. The Red Sox wanted me to ride around in a car, and I said, I'm not riding around in a car. 
that's what the fans expected. So they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. The victory lap was his idea. And uh, now, if you know Kai Yastrzemski, that's very unusual. Completely out of character. And you know what? I, I said to myself, well, you know what? Then this is part of his character that he never wanted people to see. I was uh, 24 years old and, and, and standing there by the dugout and, and watching him take a parade lap around and waving to everybody. And I started crying. And I said, wow, if I ever get to my point in time and career, is it going to be like this? When the game ended, he went outside the ballpark and he signed autographs till uh, the last person was taken care of. Somebody came up and said, you got to go down and look at this scene. There's, there are, there's a line all the way out Yawkey Way around the Boylston Street. And two by two, they let them come in and he'd sign autographs. He was there for two and a half hours. Yaz's legacy is you can come from a potato farm on Long Island if you're willing to work long enough and hard enough and hit in the cage until your hands bleed. And you're going to make it. He was perfect left fielder. To this day, I've never seen a, a better left fielder than Carl Yastrzemski, ever. He stood for the love of the game. You could see it in his eyes. He captured New England, and he went out very graciously. They had themselves a ball player for 23 years. He was there, good times and bad, but he was Boston. He was Boston baseball, he was Yaz. In their mutual love for the game, Yaz and his father competed like contemporaries. When Carl Jr. stroked a double off Satchel Paige in 1965, he knew his father already had done him one better, hitting a triple off the legendary Negro League star in a barnstorming game on Long Island 10 years earlier. Among the many accomplishments that the son holds over his father is the distinction of being the first ex-Little Leaguer to be inducted at Cooperstown. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.